Hi, hello again and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. I hope you enjoy it. Today we'll be covering a true crime case. It is the story of mother and daughter Marianne and Anna Bachmeier. This case takes us to Lübeck in Germany. Marianne Bachmeier was born on 3 June 1950 in Saarstedt, Niedersachsen, Germany. Her parents were refugees from East Prussia. Towards the end of World War II, Germans living in the area chose to evacuate and went to West Germany as war refugees. Marianne's father came from a military background. He was part of the Waffen SS, who were the combat branch of the Nazi SS. He was your typical, overly authoritative figure, an extremely strict man that liked to hand out punishments. Both Marianne's parents were also very religious. Marianne had a very tough upbringing. She was free-spirited and this meant she often clashed with her parents and their views of life and how they wanted her to grow up and behave. Marianne's father was not only strict, but he also had a drinking problem and spent most of his time at a bar close to their house. Her father was not a happy drunk, and alcohol only fueled his aggression towards Mariana and her mother. Mariana's parents ended up getting a divorce, but it wasn't long until her mother remarried. Mariana rebelled and was quite the difficult teenager. There was a lot of conflict in her mother's new relationship as well, and her mother often blamed Mariana for being the cause of this and eventually she kicked her out of the house. Mariana felt unloved and unwanted and looked to boys for love and acceptance. This led to her falling pregnant in 1966 at the age of 16. Being so young, Mariana felt like she would not be able to provide a proper home for her baby. The father was also not in the picture, so she made the difficult decision to give her daughter up for adoption. During her final year of high school in 1968, Mariana met a boy at school and they had started dating and at the age of 18, she felt pregnant again. She felt very insecure and uncertain about the future and her relationship. This made her doubt whether she was ready or able to take care of the baby. One night shortly before giving birth, she had gone out to a disco and there she was sexually violated. Still suffering from the trauma of what she had been through and now also going through the breakup of her relationship with the baby's father, Mariana decided to also give her second daughter up for adoption shortly after her birth. Mariana had finished high school, but she had no way to stay and she needed a job. This was when she discovered Tipasa, a bar and restaurant situated in Lübeck, Germany. Here she worked as a waitress at first. She later moved to working as a bartender. This job also gave her a place to stay, as she occupied the apartment above the restaurant. Mariana quite liked the schedule of working and partying late into the night and sleeping in on the mornings. She also made plenty of friends through this job. It was at this restaurant where she began an on-off relationship with the manager of the bar, Christian Berthold. This relationship led to Mariana falling pregnant for the third time. This time, however, she felt different about the pregnancy. She felt as if her life had been more stable, and she felt as if she would be able to provide for a baby for the first time in her life. The fact that she gave up her first two daughters had always eaten away at her, and she couldn't face the idea of giving up another baby. She knew she had to figure out what to do, because she didn't feel like she would be able to deal with losing another child. Christian, however, was not as excited about the idea as she would have wanted him to be. He was not ready to commit to a serious relationship and was definitely not ready to be a full-time father. But Mariana had decided that she was absolutely not going to give this baby up 
and she decided that she would have to raise the baby as a single mother then. Mariana welcomed her daughter, Anna, into the world on 14 November 1972. After having a healthy baby, Mariana decided that she did not want to have any more children, and she made the decision to have herself sterilized. At first, everything in Mariana's life centered around the newborn baby Anna. But that newborn smell only lasted for a while, and Mariana started struggling with the realities of being a single mom. It quickly sank in that she would be the only caretaker and provider for Anna. She had no one to rely on to help her with anything relating to Anna. She had to earn money to support herself and the baby and return to work very soon after the birth. She had no way to leave Anna while she was working, so she took her with her to work every day and hung out at the bar long after her shift had ended. She carried on hanging out and partying with friends and patrons at the bar long into the early morning hours. Anna grew up pretty fast and free-spirited like her mom. Her mother treated her like she was a tiny adult, and Anna had to become self-reliant from a very young age due to the way that Mariana had lived her life. Mariana was not always equipped to handle being a mother. She was still young and liked to party. It was said that she could be selfish and sometimes even neglectful of Anna. Working and socializing at the bar was what made Mariana happy. She wanted to continue living her life the way she did before she had Anna. And Anna simply had to deal with it. She had no other choice. Anna literally grew up inside the bar, spending most of her time there. It was said that Anna often fell asleep on a bench whilst her mother was either working or partying. Anna's father Christian continued working as the manager at the bar and was still involved with Marianne on and off as Anna grew older. He was also involved in Anna's life but was not a hands-on father by any means. Before she started attending school, the only escape for little Anna from the bar was sporadic trips to the countryside with Marianne and Christian when their relationship was in an on period. Mariana lived her life at night, either working or socializing, which meant that she slept during the daytime, and Anna was left to her own devices most days. While Marianne was sleeping, Anna was outside exploring her neighborhood. She formed relationships with neighbors, having conversations with them when she saw them outside, and she also liked playing with their pets. Everyone in their neighborhood and the town of Lubeck knew little Anna. Marianne, at one point, spoke to a married couple that she knew well about taking Anna into foster care as a temporary solution, but no final decision had been made. But it was definitely something that Marianna had been considering. The 5th of May in 1980 was a normal day in the life of Marianne and Anna. Seven-year-old Anna had, however, been upset with her mother that specific morning, as they had an argument the previous day. Mariana was still asleep as Anna was set to leave to go to school, but Anna had decided that she was going to give her mom the metaphorical middle finger and no go to school that day. She decided that she would instead leave the apartment and walk over to a friend's house that lived close by. Unfortunately, this friend had gone to school and was not home. Anna then turned around to head back home. She entertained herself as she walked down the streets, as she would most days whilst her mom was sleeping. She walked the cobblestone streets and had conversations with the people that she came in contact with. Unaware that Anna had gone to school, Mariana left to go to a previously scheduled appointment that she had. That afternoon she had a photo shoot with the newspaper. You see, Mariana had quite the unusual car. A Volkswagen van that was covered in paintings. It had caught the eye of a journalist who wanted to do a story about Mariana and her car. So off she went to the appointment, unaware that Anna was out and about in the neighborhood. After returning home from her appointment, there had been no sign of Anna. She was said to have returned home already from school by that time. Mariana thought that Anna might just be at one of her friend's houses after school because she had been upset with her. 
She went around the neighborhood looking to see if she could find Anna, but had no luck. She then went home and decided to wait for Anna there, but when it got dark outside and there was still no sign of Anna, she went to the police to report her daughter as missing. By the next day, Anna had still not come home, and Marianne decided to go out and look for her again, and she went to speak to more of Anna's friends at their houses, but none of them had seen her. They also informed Marianne that Anna had not been to school the previous day either. Marianne did not know where Anna could be, and she got very worried. That same afternoon, a woman walked into her local police station, wanting to report a crime. She told them that her 35-year-old fiancé, Klaus Grabowski, had confessed to her that he had killed little Anna Bachmeier. You see, Klaus Grabowski and his fiancé were neighbours of the Bachmeiers. He knew little free-spirited and chatty Anna, because she often spoke to him when she saw him, and she liked to play with their cat. When Anna was walking home from her friend's house on the 5th of May, she saw Klaus outside, and with nothing else to do, she approached him and asked him whether it was okay if she played with their cat. He agreed, and the two of them headed upstairs into his apartment. It was only him and Anna in the apartment though, as his fiancé had not been home at the time. This is unfortunately where seven-year-old Anna Bachmeier would meet her untimely death. What happened in that apartment will never really be clear, but I'm sure we can only imagine, even though we would not want to. What we do know is that Klaus Krabowski had strangled her with a pair of his fiancé's tights. When his fiancé returned home later that day, Klaus confessed to her what he had done. In total shock, she left the apartment as fast as she could and immediately went to the police and reported everything that he had told her. Grabowski took the opportunity whilst his fiancé was out to dispose of little Anna's body. He tied Anna up and put her little body in a cardboard box. He then loaded this box onto his bicycle and cycled to the banks of the canal. He proceeded to bury her on that specific bank in a shallow grave. After his fiancé had reported him, police went to the apartment with the intentions of arresting Klaus, but he was gone. He however left a note for his fiancé. In this note, he begged her not to turn her back on him. He told her that he would be waiting for her at a bar that he frequented that night, so they could talk some more. Now aware of his plans, police went to the bar and waited for him there. Klaus was arrested upon his arrival. Thirty-five-year-old butcher Klaus Krabowski was not unknown to the police. He had quite the troubled past, and that past involved sexual offences committed against minors, starting in the 1970s. In 1975, he was charged with sexually violating two young girls. He was given a psychological evaluation after this, and it was read in court during his trial. It stated, on the basis of the convincing opinion of the doctor that evaluated Mr. Grabowski, the board is undoubtedly certain that the abnormal sexual instinct of the accused is addictive. The accused was aware of the unauthorized activity, but he was considerably limited in his ability to prevent it because of his addiction to the offense. In 1976, Klaus was sentenced to spend time in a psychiatric treatment facility for his abuse of the two girls. Klaus was given a choice. If he agreed to chemical castration as part of his rehabilitation, he would be released, and if he didn't, he would need to remain in the institution for an extended period of time. Chemical castration was often seen as an easier alternative to life imprisonment of sexual offenders because it allowed for the expected rehabilitation and release of the convicted. Klaus had agreed to the chemical castration as he did not want to remain in the treatment facility any longer than he needed to. He received treatment with non-steroidal estrogen that would lower his testosterone, and they added an anti-psychotic drug. This combination would often be given to sexual deviants to attempt to decrease the person's sexual urges. This would be given in a form of a depot injection to allow the medication to release slowly over a period of time. 
Unlike surgical castration, chemical castration can be reversed. Klaus received the chemical castration treatment and was released shortly thereafter. However, there were no follow-up checks done with Klaus, either physically or psychologically after this. Part of his rehabilitation should have at least included counselling and further evaluations to try and understand his urges and how it should be dealt with, and not just treatment from a physical point of view, even though they didn't even check up if that worked. Two years after his release, Klaus visited a urologist and requested hormone treatments to reverse his castration. Klaus told this doctor that he had been castrated because he had been an exhibitionist and exposed himself to children once. The urologist felt that it was illogical and unfair that a man of such a young age had been castrated and decided to administer the hormone treatment without much question or checks about Klaus's story that he had provided. He was injected with testoviron on two occasions and prescribed more testosterone tablets to take at home. At the time of Anna's murder, Grabowski had the same level of testosterone as before his castration. When Grabowski was arrested, he confessed to Anna's murder. At first, he would not admit why Anna was in his apartment alone with him. But he did however tell police that it was not his intention to lead her up there and sexually violate her. He told police that in fact he didn't even touch Anna. Oh no no, it was Anna who provoked him to kill her because she blackmailed him. He stated that Anna had tried to seduce him and then extort him for money. Like what the f Like a seven year old tried to seduce him. I mean, he must be out of his mind. There's something really wrong with this person. He said she wanted money from him and that if he did not give it to her, she would tell her mother that he touched her inappropriately. He said that he became angry and fearful of what might happen if Anna did in fact end up reporting him. Even if he did give her money and she decided to still report him, he would most definitely go to jail or back to the psychiatric facility and his fiancé would not stay with him. He decided that he was not about to lose everything and made the decision to kill Anna. He said he felt like he had no other choice. He explained to police that Anna was sitting on a chair, busy extorting him, and as he went to go get the money, he saw the pair of stockings that belonged to his fiance, and he decided that he would use them to strangle Anna. While she was waiting for him to bring the money, he approached her from behind and put the stockings around her neck and pulled tight around her neck until Anna faded away. I'm really angry right now, so I'm just going to take a breath. He explained to police where they could find Anna's body. Police went to the site and slowly and carefully dug up little Anna's body. Anna's body had been tied, arms to ankles. After finding Anna's body, police had the difficult task of informing her 29-year-old mother that her daughter had passed away. And not only was she gone, but she had been murdered. Marianne responded in a strange way, according to police. She did not want to speak to them anymore after they told her what had happened. She was very angry and she had even refused to go to the morgue to identify Anna's body. Police were unsure how to handle this as they had never experienced a reaction like that from a mother before, but they became suspicious of her. Anna's body was later released to her mother for burial and Mariana did everything in her power to make sure that it was not your standard, traditional and religious church ceremony. She wanted it to be befitting to Anna. Throughout the days, weeks and months following Anna's death, Mariana struggled with dealing with the fact that Anna was no longer there. As the days passed, she struggled with guilt about the fight that she had with Anna the previous day, as well as the fact that she had considered putting Anna into foster care. She had spots of outbursts and crying fits, and other days 
she refused to talk to anyone and locked herself in her apartment. Anna's murder would be something that she would never be able to move on from. The months leading up to Grobovsky's trial seemed to take forever and it took a huge mental toll on Marianne. In March of 1981, almost 10 months after Anna's murder, Grobovsky's trial kicked off at the district court in Lübeck. During opening statements, the defense wanted to make it clear that Anna's life had been turbulent. They spoke about how Anna pretty much grew up on the streets and spoke about how Marianne was a neglectful mother. They spoke of how Marianne worked like nights and slept most of the day and that she did not care much about what Anna did and left her to her own devices. It was said that Anna did not go to school often, as Mariana usually overslept. It was stated that it was during this time, when she was supposed to be at school and her mother was sleeping, that she had met Krabovsky. She knew him and spoke to him and often played with his cat. Krabovsky's lawyers continued denying that he had touched Anna inappropriately and they still maintained that she blackmailed him. The prosecution during opening statements wanted to make it clear that Klaus was not just a kind neighbor who allowed Anna to play with their cats, or even a good friend to Anna. He had a past, a very colorful past, that involved sexual violations of minors. Crimes that led him to being chemically castrated. Despite him denying that he did anything sexual to Anna, the fact remained, he killed her and he admitted to it. The fact that he even said that a seven-year-old girl could seduce him was preposterous. Mariana Bachmeier made sure that she sat in the front row of the courtroom so she could look Klaus in the eyes whilst he told his lies about her daughter, while he spoke about Anna and what he had done to her. He was the monster who had taken her daughter away from her and she wanted him to know that she despised him. She even once shouted at him while he sat in his chair, calling him a pig. People seem to have quite a lot to say about Marianne's behavior in court. Some people said that she liked having the attention on herself and that she acted as if she wanted to prove to everyone that she was in fact the grieving mother despite what had come out about her parenting in the media. She wanted them to know that she had been wronged by Klaus. What I want to know is why people feel like we should just judge people for how they behave while they are grieving. I don't know what the appropriate way to act would be when you lose your child. Like I don't know how I would act if I had to look someone in the eye who killed my child. Everyone deals with grief in such a different way. I don't even want to think about the emotional turmoil that that woman must have gone through. Grief, guilt, anger. What must it even feel like to sit in a courtroom looking at a person who admitted to killing your child and then saying that she brought it on herself? No matter what they said about Marianne, it must have been absolutely horrible. On the first day of court, Klaus testified and this was very difficult to listen to, not only for Marianne, but for everyone that was there. Grabowski explained in detail what Anna's last moments were like and exactly how she died. He explained that she was seated on a chair waiting for him to bring her the money. Five Deutsche Marks. The equivalent of around three dollars. And as he approached her from behind, he had the tights in his hand. He spoke of how Anna tried to fight for her life at one point, even knocking over the chair and falling down. But he said that he continued overpowering her and pulled the stockings tighter around her little neck until she faded away. After he strangled her, he said that he heard her breath coming out of her nose. He was fixated, but then he could not stand the sight of her body any longer and wanted to get rid of it. On the second day of the trial, the urologist who had treated Klaus after his chemical castration was called to testify. He had quite a lot to answer for. He said that Grubowski had told him that he had been castrated because he had been an exhibitionist and he did not tell him much more. 
he did not inform the doctor about the crimes that he was charged with. However, you would think that the doctor would follow up regarding Klaus's criminal history before allowing any treatments to take place on him, but he didn't. He just took his word and gave him the testosterone because he felt bad for him. I mean, you don't just chemically castrate anyone, there must be a reason for it, like why did he not even go and check up, I don't understand. The doctor, however, admitted his regret having done this and admitted that it had been haunting him and he had been struggling with that decision every day after hearing about Anna's death. Marianne and Christian also filed a lawsuit against the doctor for negligence. The lawsuit was however unsuccessful and it was dismissed because they could not find an expert witness to testify of the negligence of the doctor. The issue of Klaus's castration as the only measure taken to prevent him from re-offending became a much discussed topic in the media at the time of the trial. Many questions were raised regarding the German laws on dealing with sex offenders. Everyone was questioning whether the way that they dealt with them was adequate. It seemed like there were really no set laws on how to treat or rehabilitate or incarcerate these offenders and the punishments were erratic at best. Offenders were given the option to be castrated and if they accepted, they were given their freedom without having to be monitored or checked up on and this punishment just seems to not befit the crimes, especially, I don't even want to talk about it, like, yeah. People wanted this to change and they made it known. Later on the second day of the trial, Mariana overheard a conversation that was held between the presiding judge and the defense attorney for Klaus, misunderstanding it as Klaus would be making a statement again on the third day. She was really upset about this. The whole court already had to listen to the lies that Klaus had been spouting about her daughter, and she dreaded having to hear him speak again, trying to defend himself and blaming her daughter some more. Mariana had suffered abuse in her life before, she was also blamed for being the cause of her abuse and the fact that her daughter was now being blamed for being killed scratched her up even more. Day 3 of the trial would be Friday 6 March. Outside it was a miserable, cold and rainy day. Upon Marianne's arrival to court, she noticed that there were not as many people as there were on the first two days of the trial. Klaus had been led inside the courtroom from the side door as he had been the previous two days and he was taken to sit in his chair in the dock. He sat down with his back to the public entrance door. Mariana entered the courtroom with her friends and mentioned to them how there were not a lot of people. Her friends suggested that they wait outside in the hallway for another couple of minutes for more people to arrive. As they did not want Marianne to get more upset by sitting in an empty courtroom looking at Klaus. Marianne seemed to agree and began heading back towards the doors that they had just entered, but seemingly again changed her mind. She turned back around and calmly started walking towards the chair where Klaus was sitting. There was around a 3 meter distance between them when she pulled out a 22 caliber Beretta from her coat pocket, aimed it at Klaus's back and opened fire. She fired eight shots at him and seven hit him in his back. He had still been sitting with his back turned towards the door that they had just entered and had no idea what was coming for him. He had no chance of survival and no chance of fighting back. He simply slumped forward onto the desk in front of him and then he fell over onto the courtroom floor. Mariana calmly slid the firearm across the stone floor, raised her arms and gave herself over to an officer of the court. No resistance whatsoever. At this point, she reportedly said, I wanted to shoot him in the face. I hope he's dead. Anna's father, Christian, witnessed what had happened and had muttered under his breath. She did it. She actually did it. Klaus had died on the floor where he fell over before a doctor could make it to the scene.
Germany had never seen the likes of anything like this before. Marianne's act of revenge provoked huge reactions from the media and the public. The public were torn. Some felt that if you were against the murder of Anna, then you should be against the murder of any human being. Others saw it as an eye for an eye type of justice and felt that Klaus's murder was justified due to the nature of his crimes against Anna. Most parents said they could completely understand why Mariana did what she did and said that if they were in her shoes, they would have done much worse to Klaus and they felt that he did not suffer enough. Die Öffentlichkeit. Ich habe selber einen Sohn und wenn mein Sohn auf diese bestialische Weise umgebracht würde, dann würde ich dasselbe tun wie diese Frau und ich stehe voll hinter dieser Frau. Ob das nun rechtens ist, dass sie ihn umgebracht hat oder nicht, aber jedenfalls kann ich die Frau voll unterstehen und ich würde es genauso machen. Wenn man gegen Mord ist, dann muss man generell gegen Mord sein und dann kann man auch nicht selbst Justiz üben, sondern dann muss man auch einen Mörder seiner gerechten Strafe zu. Overnight, everyone knew of vigilante mother Mariana Bachmeier. Photos of her covered the front pages of newspapers and magazines. Her face was plastered all over the local news. Within a week, a hundred thousand Deutsche Marks had been donated to an account to support Marianne with paying her legal fees. Ironically, through all of this, Klaus Grabowski had not been proven guilty because he had died during his trial. So in the eyes of the law, he will always remain innocent. Mariana was released soon after her arrest, but she was taken into custody again on the 14th of August after being flagged as a flight risk. She remained in custody whilst awaiting trial, and during this time she attempted to take her life several times. Mariana had refused to cooperate with court-appointed psychologists. They tried their best and they tried many strategies to try to get her to open up. Some strategies even brutal but she had refused. After these attempts, the court ruled that Mariana should stay in a psychiatric facility until the commencement of her trial. It was made clear that Mariana would not be pardoned just because people saw it as a vigil anti act or a mother's vengeance for the killing of her daughter. If the law just overlooked vigilante killings, everyone would start taking matters into their own hands. The public maintained their view that the court should have mercy on Mariana. All eyes were then on the prosecution to see how they would handle Mariana's case. For Mariana to be convicted of first degree murder, they had to prove that she had planned Klaus's attack in advance. As their first point to her pre-planning the killing of Klaus, they noted Christian's comment shortly after his shooting, where he stated that she did it, she actually did it. This, they felt, made it clear to them that Mariana did not simply snap in the moment when she shot Klaus. This exclamation from Christian's mouth indicated that she more than likely planned this or at least thought about the shooting and she discussed it with him, which led to premeditation. One of the regulars from Tipasa also told police that Mariana had purchased a gun from another patron at the bar and that she even practiced shooting at targets in the cellar of Tipasa. Knarzer and Axel Petermann entfernen einen Teil des Kneipenbodens. Kaum etwas hat sich hier verändert in den letzten Jahrzehnten. Noch immer gibt es den versteckten Kellereingang, von dem Gäste dem Journalisten Knarzer berichtet haben. Und hier ist dann der Keller gewesen, in dem sie geschossen haben soll. Ja, das ist der Keller gewesen, in dem sie geschossen haben soll, wie man ja sagen muss. Gesehen habe ich es jedenfalls nie. Ich habe es nur gehört von den Stammgästen, die hier deutlich wussten, um was es geht. Axel Petermann will sich die versteckten Räume einmal genauer ansehen. Hat Marianne Bachmeier hier vor ihrer Tat das Schießen geübt? Ich könnte mir schon durchaus vorstellen, dass dort unten geschossen worden ist. 
Marianne admitted to investigators that she did buy the weapon from someone at Tepasa Bar. But she stated that she bought it because she had felt unsafe before the start of Klaus's trial, with all eyes on her. She had bought it for self-defense, and that she did not buy it with the intent of murdering Klaus. She said that she hid the firearm inside a bag and buried it in Anna's grave. She said that she took it out when she felt even more unsafe leading up to the trial and carried it with her for that reason. She stated it had not been her intention at all to shoot Klaus Krabowski. In 1981, during Klaus's trial, there was no security checks in place at the courthouse and Marianne could easily take the firearm into the court without anyone picking up that she had it with her. She stated to the investigators that she did not do any target practice, as the patron had said, even if they felt that she had been a very, very accurate shot. She said that Klaus had been a big man and an easy target who did not see the attack coming, which is why she shot him so accurately. Experts still felt that she must have had some knowledge of how to handle a firearm because of her calm and collected execution of shooting Klaus. On the 2nd of November 1982, the courts made the decision that Marianne would be charged with murder in the first degree, because she did go to the courtroom with the gun in her pocket. This looked like a premeditated plan to kill the man who had killed her daughter. Mariana's trial started on 2 March 1983, four months after she was charged. The courtroom was fully packed every day and it was mostly made up of women, mothers, who came to support Mariana. So many people attended that they had to change location to another hall that could seat more people. Mariana had been thrust into the limelight and became somewhat of a celebrity. She did not shy away from the cameras. In fact, she looked straight at them, almost posing as they took photos and videos of her. This behavior was again strange to most, as usually defendants charged with murder avoided photographers. All eyes were on Marianne. She dressed fashionably, she looked beautiful and well put together. She did not look like someone that would cower in a corner. She looked fierce and strong. During the trial, Mariana's defense team argued that the shooting was spontaneous and in the heat of the moment, caused by the emotional turmoil that Mariana had been going through during Klaus's trial. Mariana had misunderstood the discussion between the judge and Klaus's lawyer and believed that Klaus would be making another statement on the day that she shot him. She thought that he was going to be telling more lies about how Anna had blackmailed him and provoked him to kill her. This is when, thinking about all these lies, she shot him in the moment. They said that she definitely did not plan it. It was not premeditated. It was in a moment where she was overwhelmed and she pulled the trigger to end it all. The prosecution, however, wanted to remind everyone that Mariana was known as the vigilante mother of Germany but that she was a neglectful mother. They reminded everyone that seven-year-old Anna was left to her own devices more often than not since a very early age. They also wanted to make it known that Mariana had even taken the first steps to put Anna into foster care and that she in fact did not want to take care of Anna anymore. The prosecution felt that she was not driven by vengeance and that she killed him out of guilt and anger and that she pre-planned it. She had bought the gun, she had brought it to court and she knew what she was going to do. And she did it where everyone could see her, the heartbroken mother of Anna. After 25 days of the trial, with many witnesses called, the verdict was said to be read. It could have gone either way. Both sides had made convincing arguments and no one could predict which way the court would rule. Everyone was on pins and needles, 
waiting. The charges made against Marianne was those of first-degree murder, but this was not the ruling that they came back with. Instead, Marianne was convicted of manslaughter and unlawful possession of a firearm, and she was sentenced to six years in prison. The prosecutors were outraged and they felt that they had proven premeditated murder. They stated that Marianne was not provoked or in any danger in the moment that she had pulled that trigger. Also, Grabowski had been sitting with his back to her and did not even know that she was coming at him. He proved no threat to her whatsoever in the moment. Marianne also had openly admitted that she had the pistol on her when she went to court the previous two days. And the fact that she brought the firearm with her into the courtroom should have proven intent. The judge, however, stated that he felt that justice had been served. In his opinion, Mariana had not been a threat to society, and he strongly felt that Klaus's killing was a spontaneous act committed in the moment, and that she did in fact suffer from emotional turmoil. He felt that it was caused by the trauma that Marianne had to sit through and the emotions that she felt during the court proceedings the previous few days. Thus, the ruling remained. Mariana walked out of the courtroom freely. She was not taken into custody. She was only required to hand herself in at a later date. During her first 18 months of incarceration, Mariana had remained on suicide watch after her previous attempts that she had made on her life. They feared that she might attempt to take her life again. She was kept in a psychiatric facility and then later moved to a prison. Marianne had ended up being released from prison in June 1985 after serving only three years of her six-year sentence. This again raised eyebrows all over Germany. Some had felt that the initial sentencing of six years had been too harsh from the get-go, and others felt that it was not harsh enough, because in fact, she did end up taking someone's life. They put forth the question, isn't murder still murder, regardless of the circumstances? After her release, Mariana did several interviews in magazines and on TV. In one interview, she said that she wanted to be the one who punished Grabowski. She did not want to leave it in the hands of the judicial system. As his punishments he received previously clearly did not stop him from doing what he did to Anna. The death sentence was abolished in West Germany in 1949 and Grabowski would never be put on death row for his crimes against Anna. If the judge had decided that there would be a possibility for Klaus to serve a life sentence with the possibility of parole, he would have been eligible to apply within the prescribed time put forth by the judge, which meant that he could have been a free man at some point. In another interview on a German talk show, she said that she had shot Grabowski to stop him from spreading any more lies about her seven-year-old daughter. She said she did not want to avenge her daughter's death, that was not the intent, but she had wanted to prevent him from making a statement that she felt would be more insulting to Anna. Marianne also said that once she was told that Grabowski had died, she felt like she could breathe again for the first time since Anna's death. She said, I can't imagine that I would have shot this person if he had turned around and said that he was sorry about what he had done. Mariana said that she was sorry that it had to happen, but she was not sorry that Klaus was dead. What had bothered many people over the years was the fact that Mariana clearly never showed remorse for what she had done, and she never stated that she felt guilty for what she had done. Mariana sold her life story to German magazine Stern for 250,000 Deutsche Marks. She used the money to pay off debts that she owed for legal fees. The magazine published a series of articles on Marianne and her life, and those articles were made into a film called Anna's Mutter. Marianne got married in 1985 after her release and moved to Nigeria with her husband, who taught German language at a German camp there. 
They divorced in 1990 and Mariana moved to Palermo, Sicily, where she worked as a caregiver at a hospice. She said that she would never want to return to Lübeck, Germany, because there she would only ever be known as Anna's mother. However, she was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and she returned to Germany. She asked a reporter to film her last days. This was a visual diary of Mariana preparing for death and it seemed to show more of Mariana's need for attention and sympathy. Mariana passed away on 17 September 1996 in Lübeck at the age of 46 and despite her wishes to be buried in Palermo, she was laid to rest in the same grave as her daughter Anna in Lübeck. This left her forever memorialized as Anna's mother the one thing that she never wanted to be known as. So that is it for today's case. As always, I would love to know your thoughts and opinions on this case. Do you feel that Mariana was justified in what she did? Do you feel that it was pre-planned? Do you feel that it was a heat of the moment type thing? Do you think she liked the attention? Please leave your comments down below. As always, thank you so much for clicking on this video. If you got this far, I really do appreciate you. Please remember to leave me a like and subscribe if you've not done so, so far. It's a free way that you can help me out. Until next time, bye.